Hey, welcome back to the table. So this would be, we're starting part three right now. And uh, we just did the, so we advanced the counter, we did the resupply, which was the new expansion. That was one entire expansion is spent on that resupply step. Next, we're gonna do is scouting. Now scouting is, uh, you have to pay a supply point. And there's four of these scouting markers available. So you can basically spend up to four supply points to do scouting. I spent all my supply points. I have nothing to spend. So we're not going to do scouting. Uh, you're going to find that I don't really... Uh, scouting's pretty weak, if you ask me. Um, and uh, it'll make more sense once you see how the rest of the mechanics work. But basically what scouting does is for every point you spend, you can pick uh, a zone. So like, for example, we can pick um, the surface fleet number two right here. We can pick them and say, hey, um, I want to see where they're going to go. And so we're going to scout and get some advanced intelligence on where are they going to move. And um, the United States goes first. We do all of our moves without knowing what they're going to do. And then after we finish our movement, then we roll to see what the AI is going to do. And the AI is pretty unpredictable except for this one thing. It's predictable in 1942, largely because when you roll for them, let's just explain that a little bit, it's a 10-sided die. So the best they can do is roll up to 10, which is only the first three orders here. In order for them to get these other orders that are further down, you need to add more to that 10, right? Um, and in order to add more to that 10, that's what this resupply chart is. And here you can see in 1942, they add plus zero to the die roll. Then if this accumulates, they're going to eventually add plus two. And then only once it gets to the third and fourth row is it going to start to become a little bit deadlier. So um, chances are extremely high that when you spend a scouting point in 1942, now when you get to 44 and 45, that might actually be a little smarter to use a scouting point for. But in this early game, it's really a waste of your money. And here's, you know, after explaining everything now, uh, when you roll for the scouting, you're rolling a 10-sided die, you're adding nothing to it because the uh, resupply points always start the turn at zero. So the best you're gonna get is they're gonna hold, which means they don't move at all. They're gonna refit, which means they move back to Japan and we're not allowed to go to Japan. Or they're gonna withdraw and move closer to Japan. In none of those three scenarios are they moving towards you. So I guess you could argue, okay, I'm going to spend a scouting point to force them to go back home. So you can take, you know, a fleet that you don't want to engage this turn. And by doing it, you're giving them a death sentence to go home or stay where they are. <laughs> that, I guess there is some strategy there, but uh, it's just not worth doing uh, in the beginning. Like I said, and maybe in 44 and 45, I will change my mind because we're adding a lot more to the die roll there. Okay, so the scouting step is skipped for this turn because we're not doing any. And now we do the movement. So we do US movement first. And uh, basically we can move anything on the board almost anywhere. Uh, there's a couple exceptions and let's talk about that. First of all, these ships are not available to me. They're in like a refit. They're like in, you know, being refit and they're in the dock. The only ships that are available are the ones that are at Hawaii or anywhere else on the map. Ships can go anywhere, uh, except for Japan itself uh, and East Asia. So we can't, you know, go attack Japan and East Asia, but we can go anywhere else on the board. And uh, there is no such thing as movement points or you just say where you wanna go and that's where you go, okay? That's the first thing to get your arms around. The planes can go anywhere as well, except they can only go somewhere where you actually are in, have ground units on the island at the start of the movement phase. So, uh, for example, I cannot move planes to the Caroline Islands because that's only Japan's there. I can, however, move planes here because even though Japan's there, I'm already here at the start of the turn. I can also move planes to Borneo because the same reason, even though Japan's there, we're also there, okay? Next step issue is that the planes have a limit. Every island has a limit. So for example, Samoa here 
can only have two planes. Uh, you know, the Gilbert Islands can have four. Okay, so you got to be mindful of that as well. There's a limit. Uh, but beyond that, the planes can go, like I said, anywhere you want. Um, there is also another exception. Uh, the planes and the infantry sometimes have a, like the, uh, the British uh, Union Jack, I guess, is that the right term for that symbol? Um, the, you know, they basically have the Australian flag uh, to the right. And you can see it here right where my thumb is pointing. And those, those types of units are restricted to only be in the places that have Australian flags. So here, uh, the Solomon Islands, I believe. Yep. Australia itself. And then New Guinea and Borneo. Uh, they can't move anywhere else. And that's actually a tricky one. I always catch myself moving them when I shouldn't. Okay, so uh, keep me honest on that one. And, um, okay, that's enough with the planes. The infantry can actually move anywhere except for Japan and East Asia. Anywhere a ship can go, infantry can go. And what they would do is they load up on a transport. So wherever they end up, even if it's a friendly place, so even if this infantry is just moving from here to here, they're going to be on a transport. So when the Japanese do their turn, if they actually come here to invade this area, they're going to catch that infantry on a transport at the beginning of the battle round. And it's possible they can sink the transport. Okay, That infantry is not going to be safely on the island. Not yet. Um, and of course, that's how we invade other islands, right? Same concept. Um, and uh, we can, like, like in this situation, reinforce something we already control. So those are all options to us that are available to us. Um, a key thing to bear in mind is that if I move this battalion somewhere else, we're going to lose control of New Caledonia. So we would lose that objective um, because you have to always maintain at least one ground unit, whether it's a plane or an aircraft. Um, I, plane or an aircraft. Plane or an infantry. Okay. Um, I don't think we talked too much about the fact that carriers do have planes. They have their own planes. And the carrier planes are going to have this blue bottom. So if you compare the two, right, you can see the blue bottom is pretty clear and easy to see. Carrier planes are only on carriers. They're unlimited, so if they ever get destroyed, the carrier just replaces them. There's nothing you have to pay or, or do to replace them. They're just a part of the carrier. They're the reason why the carrier costs five points to build. Okay? So uh, don't worry about them as much. And they're not going to be on the board during the movement phase. If you move the carrier, these are moving with the carrier. Okay? And they don't launch until you do the actual battles. Now, the land-based aircraft are the ones that don't have the blue borders on the bottom. And they're uh, going to have, um, this up here is the dogfight value for air-to-air -air combat. And then this is for uh, bombing. So this is a case where uh, it's a combo platter. It's a wildcat and a dive bomber. And the four in blue means that's what it would, uh, that's its value for bombing sea targets, naval targets. And then the yellow one is for bombing land targets. So... This one's slightly better at bombing the sea targets. And it's uh, for, for U.S. standards in 1942, that's actually also pretty good for air-to-air -air combat. Okay, so, um, okay, with all that out of the way, let's uh, actually do our movement step. And uh, the first thing to point out is I can't move this one or this one uh, because I would lose control of objectives, and I don't want to do that. Uh, same goes with this one, right? Same deal. Now what I can do, if you're wondering, I can move somebody to here, right? So that way I can move this away. That is possible. Um, remember, if I'm moving like a, a, a land-based unit, it's gonna be on a transport. And again, I would temporarily lose control, but as soon as that transport lands the unit, I would get it back, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so what do we got? Well, one of the things I learned with this new expansion is that these uh, orders have changed a bit. And uh, one of them is, is that they go straight for Midway Island if they ever get a 19 or higher, which is possible based on how the mechanics work. And they'll go straight for Midway Island. They skip everything else and just go straight to Midway. So I learned 
that you need to always defend midway. Uh, otherwise, you're going to lose it constantly, and that's actually what happened in my previous playthrough. Um, they do have other ways that they can attack you, and I'm not saying that these are less likely, but this is the only one that calls out midway. Everything else is just like a random die roll, and they may go to this objective or that objective, but this one's just flat out calling out midway. So you got to... Uh, defend midway and if you don't then they're going straight for the hawaiian islands so and that's even worse okay so we want to defend midway first objective and of course we want to take our objectives so uh we have the gilbert islands here which is lightly defended with only one unit and then we have new guinea which is actually under some serious attack so we probably want to go and help defend new guinea and i think thematically um you know this is where our first carrier conflict with uh, Japan actually occurred. Um, so, uh, so well done, DVG. Uh, okay. So, how do we want to do this? Well, uh, there are several strategies. We can divide up our ships and split them between the three places. Uh, I gamble. I gamble a lot, and like since this is only one unit, I just send a few units here, thinking that that's all I need. And next thing I know, when Japan takes their turn, they send everything they got there. Um, it's possible. <laughs> you know, you, you can't always just assume that it's going to be a cakewalk. Oh, sorry. Hmm, I had to yawn, so apologies there. So uh, I think a priority is defending New Guinea. We don't want to lose New Guinea. Um, but the good news is, is we can defend New Guinea with Australian troops and planes if we have them. And uh, Borneo is an issue because uh, right now they're, it's just one versus one. So we may want to help that out as well. It's not one of our objectives. And then I can also tell you in 1943, um, the Marshall Islands and Wake Island both become new objectives. So if some point during 1942, we can take control of these and roll into 1943, we're gonna have that much of a leg up on them. So, uh, and you can see Midway Island. I can't move him away because, um, again, he's the only one defending. So, now I need to make some hard decisions. Alaska, very similar deal, uh, but I could move one of the planes out of Alaska. And it's always a big debate on which one, because one of them's a really good fighter, the other one's a decent uh, land bomber. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the really good fighter. So this one is in Alaska. He's a darn good fighter, and uh, I'm going to move him all the way to New Guinea, because I think they need a fighter presence, because there are Japanese planes already on the New Guinea. And by the way, we can have up to eight planes there. So that's a big airport for us. Uh, we have a, a plane here in Australia uh, that's not so bad. Um, uh, it's definitely not an Australian one, so we can actually move it to other places. Like we can send this one to Midway, but I'm actually going to put that one in New Guinea as well. So we're up to four. And then if I look at Hawaii, um, I do have a really nice infantry unit here. Um, and then I have three more planes. And I think what I'm going to do is... Uh, hmm, that's actually a tough choice. This one is going to go to Midway. Because remember, I want to defend Midway. And I can have two planes there. So now, do I want to move the infantry or do I want to move my planes? That's a really good question. I would say that this guy is not super great. I mean, it has 3-2. He only has a one naval value. Um, he's decent. It's a P-39. I'm going to leave him on Hawaii to defend Hawaii. I'm going to send this one to New Guinea because I want more fighter presence there. And then I actually have an infantry because if I leave this plane behind, I can keep the Hawaii objective. I have an infantry I can send somewhere. So I am going to send it... Um, To be quite honest, I want to send it to Midway. Um, yeah, I'm sending it to Midway. 
And the reason is, I know I need him on New Guinea. I Trust me, I really do need him on New Guinea, but Midway is such an important objective to hold. So I'm gonna send him to Midway. And if you look way over here in the West Coast, I have two battalions and I'm gonna send them to various places. Uh, one is gonna get on a transport and go here to the Gilbert Islands. So we're gonna try to take the Gilbert Islands. And then the other one is gonna go help out in New Guinea and He's gonna to try to land over here in New Guinea. Um, might be a little bit of overkill, but we it would be nice to have an infantry presence there. And then once we get, um, you can see here, we're actually building an Aussie troop there with a value of four. Um, I can build him and he can move to New Guinea and protect that objective. And then I can take the American troop and move it somewhere else to take a different objective. So, uh, so now what's left is we have to support it with our uh, our ships. And here's what we have available to us. We have some submarines, which I can use to go to battle, or I can put them in the raiding box up here. If I put them in the raiding box up here, they will impact the, the new Japanese reinforcements that arrive later in the turn. Uh, they subtract three from the die roll uh, for that. Um, I tend to like to keep these in battle, even though it's really hard for them to hit. They need to roll two or less and a 10-sided die to hit. Um, the other th option we have is we can leave them in Hawaii. If we leave a, pl a ship in Hawaii, it's going to be available next turn. Otherwise, any ship that you don't have in Hawaii this turn is going to end up uh, going through this refit step, like these ships that you see here. So basically, every other turn, we're going to get to use these. Um, so let's sort this out. I have a sub, I have a destroyer, another destroyer. We got the cruisers. One, two, three, four, five cruisers, and two carriers. Now, on the west coast, I have another destroyer, a third one. So I can bring that over. And then over in um, Australia, I have another sub and another cruiser. So I think what I'm gonna do is, let's take, let's start with New Guinea here. We're gonna support it with that cruiser and one of the subs, right? And I'm gonna send one of my carriers there, uh, the Enterprise. So he's gonna to go to New Guinea. And when you send a carrier somewhere, it behooves you to at least have one destroyer with it for anti-air and depth charge support. And we already have one cruiser, and I'm going to send uh, two more over. So we got a lot of cruisers there. So now we're going to go to Midway, which I also need to defend. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two cruisers on Midway. And then the Lexington carrier, I'm actually gonna have support this. And I'm gonna have a destroyer go with him and um, one of the cruisers will also go with him. So that's gonna support the Gilbert Islands. And then the other sub and um, destroyer, I'm gonna have defend Midway. Now, this could be a complete backfire crapshoot kind of thing because we don't know what um, what's going to happen with Japan. And again, that's where the scouting orders come in, but like I told you, there's not enough scouting points to uh, make a difference, but um, uh, that's what we're gonna do. So we're done with our movement. We've moved everybody we could possibly move, to be quite honest. Um, uh, I really did wanna support Borneo. Um, I'm just not gonna be able to. So I'm gonna have to let that play itself out. So now we're going to go to um, the Japanese orders. And the way the Japanese uh, turn works is they have a rule as well. Any location that's held by a land-based unit, whether it's a plane or an infantry, uh, they can't move. And we're talking about at the start of the movement turn. So that's where these little bingo chips come in. So I have, for example, the Mariana Islands is defended by one unit. So that means that his movements, he can't move this turn. So his movement phase is over. So we're going to put
put these on to indicate where Japan is not able to move. And so Okinawa is one. Now Japan and uh, East Asia are exceptions. Uh, they don't do that. They can uh, be down to zero. Now there's another rule that if you're in a place that has US units on the same location as you, you can't move. So that one is a double rule for them, but that also means these guys can't move either because there's US presence on the island. And uh, this one, however, if there was more than one here, they could have moved because we haven't landed yet, even though we have a presence there. But he's the sole guy holding that island, so he can't move either. Okay, there's two guys here, so they can move. One of them can, at least. Uh, here's another interesting one. There's a surface fleet there, but remember, the determination is only land-based. So that's covered up. And... Uh, the Philippines has a whole bunch of planes and infantry, so we don't do that, okay? So all this exercise is doing is we're basically identifying all the Japanese pieces that aren't moving this turn. So now we're going to actually do the movement action for them. And what you do is you pick the area that has the least amount of troops first. And this can get tricky because you look at this and say, okay, this is only one troop, and that's not true because Surface Fleet 1 actually has one, two, three, four, five ships, and then looks like two units on the transport there, right? So that's seven. And um, I may have forgotten to tell people during setup, uh, everywhere there's a transport, you have to fill it up with, with troops. You start with troops that are based in Japan, and then you grab battalions if there's none left. But uh, the, the fleets, anytime they move, from wherever they are to somewhere else, the transports always get filled up. And it's gonna be filled up from the location they're leaving from, um, or if there's none available, they're gonna grab them from the battalion pool. You just grab them for free. Now, why is it that I said that you needed to take them from Japan? Well, uh, that's for setup. So um, uh, that's not necessarily true. Well, actually, it is true after that. Uh, like. So if I'm moving from one location to another and there's not enough troops at the location I'm moving from, I go to look at Japan first and grab my troops from there. And then if I'm out of troops there, then I use battalion. So yes, that is true no matter what. So like I said, if these are ever moving from one place to another, their transports need to fill up. They're always full of troops, okay? So sorry if that made sense the first of the five times I repeated myself there, um, but it's a... Uh, it's an important concept to, to get right. Okay, so where do they have the least amount of troops? Uh, it's clearly this one. There's two. Um, and remember, at least amount of troops that can actually move. So it's going to be that one. It's two. So what we do is it's a simple die roll. We're just going to roll die. I rolled a nine, which is actually a pretty high roll. I look at the chart up here. And I see that we're at zero, and it's 1942, and we add plus zero to the die roll. Okay? So nine plus zero is nine. And then we take the movement order and we put it on the nine spot, uh, eight to ten, right? That's withdrawal. So they're going to move one closer to Japan. Well, who moves one closer to Japan? In the base game, you're going to pick two ships. But because we're using fleets, uh, you ignore that. It's just one fleet. And ignore the fact that it says three or two or anything like that. It's just one fleet. So um, there's no fleets at this location. So we ignore the ships. One infantry or two land-based aircraft. That's what the LBAC stands for. Okay. Now, um, there is an asterisk. It says if there is no Japanese forces ashore, uh, move the aircraft to Japan instead of the uh, one closer to Japan. Right. So uh, the aircraft's not going to move one closer to Japan unless there's um, Japanese forces there. Let's look at our situation. Uh, well, clearly, one closer to Japan would be to go this way. And, of course, there's Japanese forces there. So the aircraft or the infantry can move. Now, uh, which one moves, though? Uh, that's just random. So we're going to say uh, uh, that the even for the infantry, odd for the aircraft. I rolled an odd. So the aircraft is moving to the Caroline Islands, 
and then after it moves, its movement turn is over. And then the infantry can't move because one needs to stay behind at all times. Um, now, uh, if I had another infantry there, I would have moved both because this order, this withdrawal order, is saying move all of these, not just one of them, okay? Uh, but that wasn't the case here. So, uh, and then um, this number here under the resupply is a one. So what that means is the resupply is gonna move up by one. And that's how they get to better commands. So after a while, it's going to build up, and then eventually they're going to roll high enough to get a really nice order. Okay, so we keep going, and I think the Surface Fleet 1 really is the next one, because it's sort of sitting by itself. I know it consists of multiple ships, but, um, but uh, the problem is, is so do all the other Surface Fleets that are everywhere else. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Let's roll. I rolled a seven. So that's going to be a refit, which goes back to Japan. And it moves the supply marker up by two. So we're already close to moving up to the next notch. Surface Fleet 1 goes back to Japan and gets red marker. Uh, you're going to find in 1942 that they do that a lot. Um, they get a lot more aggressive as the years go on, and Japan's going to be uh, attacking a lot more then. Okay, so what's next? Uh, I think that the Philippines will be next. And so we're going to go ahead and do that one. So let's roll. I rolled a five. It's still a plus zero. That's a refit. They go back to Japan. So we're going to take one fleet and one infantry and three land-based aircraft. But then this goes up by two. Okay, so what does it, all that mean? Well, one fleet is the surface fleet two. So it's gonna go back to Japan and it's done. And then we said one infantry, which really will move to Japan and leave the island because we have all these aircraft. And then it said three of the aircraft and you just grab it from the top of the stack. You don't like randomly select which ones. And they're all moving back to Japan. So we just put our little markers on them. And, uh, but we're not done because there's still more aircraft that can move. Because remember, they can't move if there's only one. So uh, we roll again. So that stack of Philippines, uh, just because I rolled a five doesn't mean that five represents the entire stack. It just represents whatever number uh, we used. So now I'm going to roll an eight. And now we add two because there's a plus two and I got a 10, which is a withdrawal. So they're going to move one closer to Japan. And you can see here it's two land-based aircraft and one infantry. Well, we're, there's no infantry to move. And so it's just going to be two aircraft and they're going to move to Okinawa. But we still got one left. So we got to do it again. And all the while, this is moving up. So we roll again. I rolled a five plus two is seven. So we got a refit. And even though it says move three aircraft, we can only move one. And so now the final aircraft is there. So uh, don't get fooled by the fact that, you know, oh, I rolled a refit. That means that everything that's at that location goes in refits. That's not true. Uh, you could, uh, like, it took us three die rolls to just get process through all the units in the Philippines. And you're going to see it again now because now we're going to do uh, East Asia and it's going to be a similar concept. So let's roll for them. I rolled an eight again. Uh, hold on. I think we forgot to do the plus two here. So I believe this goes to not eight. So if I uh, double counted that, I apologize. I just don't remember. So uh, eight plus five is 13. So now we're getting into some of the juicier orders. So here you can see they're moving east, which is one closer to Hawaii Islands. Uh, and they need to move somewhere that has Japanese forces ashore. And if they cannot do that, then they're gonna do something even more powerful, which um, it is possible, but that's not the case here. They're moving one closer to Hawaii east. And what's crazy here is east for them means uh, going to Japan. So 
again, I'm just trying to find a spot for the camera here. So you take the battleship fleet, the one on top, we move it to Japan, and then uh, I'm looking off camera here, it says one infantry, which would be this one, right? And then it says two planes. So there's only one plane, but that plane will move, okay? So we still have two infantry and two fleets to deal with here. And the number is zero, so uh, it doesn't move the supply marker up. So I rolled a nine plus five is 14. So this one's going to battle. And uh, so they're gonna go anywhere that's already a battle. And it's gonna move a fleet and one infantry. So the surface fleet number three is going to battle and then this infantry is gonna go with them. And what you do is you grab a transport and just load it like so. Okay, so where's it gonna go to battle? Well, you have to randomly determine. We actually only have two battles in play. We have, well actually we have three. We have Borneo, we have this one for two, and we have this one for three. Midway is not a battle, we already control Midway. So um, I'm just gonna do three, six, nine. I rolled a three, okay? So that's not very exciting, but what they're doing is they're moving to support the Borneo invasion. So uh, we're gonna get slaughtered there, is basically what that's going to do for us. And again, the battle action is zero. So now we're gonna continue. I rolled a three plus five is eight. I got a withdrawal. So move one closer to Japan. So this guy is gonna move to Japan. Actually, hold on. This is one of the ones I know I got wrong, and somebody corrected me. Uh, I wish it was written on the board, and it's not. So you sort of have to like remember some of these from the rule book, but it says, for example, in a withdrawal order, um, it's gonna move one closer to Japan. However, uh, if it's already going to Japan and East Asia, they don't, they don't perform the order. So then they're gonna do a hold order instead. So uh, that's the problem with um, the withdrawal order. The support order is very similar. They're gonna move closer to Japan, but they um, uh, you can't do it if the forces are already in Japan. Whereas here, they wanna to move to an area with Japanese forces are except for Japan. And so again, the, the problem here is, is that they wanna move into Japan. So uh, we gotta do a hold order there. With refit, they can't perform it if they're in Japan already, because refit makes them move to Japan. So that's another one. And then like we did the uh, East and battle action. If I go look at those, It's just saying that you can't perform the order if there's nowhere to go, right? But it doesn't say um, anything about, you know, canceling or whatever in those cases. Um, so what happens is, is we don't do a withdrawal action. We actually do a hold action. So did I already withdraw something? I had to have. Yeah, so Carrier Fleet 1 is staying there because they're doing a hold action, okay? Or, yeah, because I was rolling for something, right? Yeah, yeah, I was. So they're doing a hold action, and they, they will stay there. Yes, they will. And the hold action moves the marker up by 4. That's the big thing. 1, 2, 3, 4... So uh, now things are gonna really get magical. So I'm getting a little lazy with my markers. This one's done. This one's a part of the done crew. The only things that are left to move are these four fleets. That's it, just the fleets. All, excuse me, all the planes, everything else is moved. Now, one other thing to point out is this Surface Fleet 3. If we look on here, this card, there's a transport with one Infantry and since they're joining a battle that infantry that battalion goes on with the transport and it participates in the battle And if that ever were to move away from the island Obviously, they would take a troop with them 
And if they can't, they pull from Japan. Um, so that's the rule I was trying to talk about. So let's roll for these four fleets there. And remember, we're now at plus 10 to our die roll. So those four fleets might engage us big time. So let's figure this out. And there it is. I rolled a 10. So a 10 plus a 10 is a 20. And so now they're doing the offensive. And it is the Carrier Fleet 5. Okay, so Carrier Fleet 5 is going to Midway Island. And so sure enough, uh, we're going to be in a battle there at Midway, just as I predicted. Um, and uh, the thing, though, is, is it says minus 8. So then we go minus 4, minus 8. So the, the threat meter, if you will, uh, went down. So now we're going to roll for the next one. And by the way, Carrier Fleet 5 is right here. He has one unit, so he goes on a transport. That goes with them. Okay, so now we roll for the next guy. I rolled a 5 plus a 2 is 7, and that is a refit. Okay, but they're in Japan already, so it becomes a hold. Like, I want to write in, you know, some, some of those things, but Carrier Fleet 4 will do a hold, and the value of a hold for them is it adds plus 4. So now we move to Carrier Fleet 3. I rolled a 2 plus 5 is 7. That's a refit, which becomes a hold again. So Carrier Fleet 3 uh, does the hold, and now we're on Carrier Fleet 2. What are they going to do? A 7 plus a 10 is 17. So they're going to do a sortie. All right, so they go to a U.S.-held objective other than Hawaii and Alaska. Okay, so what we do is we look at the U.S.-held objectives other than Hawaii and Alaska, and there's a few. We've got this one for one, two, three, and then Midway is four. Okay, um, we ignore Hawaii and Alaska. So since we have four of them, I'm going to do two, four, six, eight. And then if I roll a 9 or a 10, I'll just re-roll. Sorry, camera issue there. Here we go. So I rolled a 10. So I'm going to re-roll a 10. And I rolled a 3. So um, I said 2, 4. So they're actually going to go here, which is a problem for us. So Carrier Fleet 2 is attacking New Caledonia. And Carrier Fleet 2 gets a transport with two battalions, like so. All right, so I hope that made sense. Uh, that concludes the, uh, the Japanese movement phase. And so uh, what I like to do then is uh, I remove the marker from everywhere where there's not a battle. And I'm actually gonna put a marker there for the battle, same here. And uh, it just helps me to visualize where the battles are going to be so I don't forget. And I don't know, like, how many of you have actually recorded videos for YouTube or something like that. But there's something about when you're recording and then trying to play a game at the same time. Your mind is going a hundred different directions. And even the simplest of things you forget to do. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, I know I, uh, I personally know um, Colin from One Stop Co-op Shop. Uh, he doesn't even live very far from me, in fact, uh, within five minutes. And um, uh, what's interesting is uh, he he scripts his, his videos. Like, he knows exactly what he's going to do. And he even, like, will script his die rolls sometimes, you know, where he records himself rolling the die and then just splices in what he wants the die roll to be so he can, you know, follow the script. It's pretty cool. Um, it's way more work than I would do. But that's why, you know, he gets the big bucks and I don't. But um, uh, what's interesting about it, though, is that, uh, you know, for him, the scripting makes it so you don't have to think as much while you're recording. And, and there's some truth to that. So, um, you know, well done to him. His videos are excellent. Um, so I definitely find them helpful myself. So... Um, and he happens to like a lot of the same games as me, but uh, he's not a big fan of war games. Um, uh, not even in the slightest, in fact. 
so I think he has somebody helping him with war games uh, to cover those. Okay, so, um, all right, enough about him. I'm sure he's going to be thrilled to know I'm talking about him and revealing all of his trade secrets. But um, uh, anyways, he's an awesome guy. If you haven't seen him, check out his videos. Uh, he does great, great work. Um, very instructional. So uh, what's our next step? Well, the next step is just simply to resolve the battles. And this is going to take a long time. Uh, if you don't like the way the battles work, you're not going to like this game. So what do we do? Well, we can start with some of the, like, the ones where they're going to cream us. Or we can start with a battle that's a little bit more involved. Um, I, last time I recorded this, and I know those videos are deleted now, but um, I tried to take the simple one first, where, you know, where there's just one troop against one troop. And I think I'm actually better off doing a full-blown battle, explaining the rules for that. And then when we do the simpler ones, it'll make more sense. So let's do, let's do New Guinea, because I think that's going to be uh, the best one to, to start off with. And it's a, a definitely an involved battle here. So what I'm doing off camera is I'm trying to find the, um, the New Guinea chart which I just found. And so we're going to use this battle board, right, to do our battles. And in a basic game, there's a basic island there, and there's no reason you can't use that. But what they did with one of these expansions is they gave us, like, one that's specifically for New Guinea, and it's shaped like New Guinea, and you just slide it into place and line up the lines, and then um, now you got yourself a New Guinea battle board. And then they tried to add, like, special rules, which so far have just proven to be things that Jeff forgets when he's doing his videos. <laughs> um, as far as the battle board rules go, the battle board itself uh, plays exactly the same. In fact, the combat steps, as you can see listed here, are written on the original battle board. Nothing changes. You just have special rules for the island. That's it. That's all it does. It adds some, and then it gives you some nice flavor. So uh, that's one of the expansion packs. Um, I think it's pretty cool, actually. Um, but uh, with the exception that I always forget to do the special rules. Okay, <clears throat> so what you do is you then grab the units and move them over to this battle board. And, um, and in fact, the steps are right here. There's a setup step, and then there's the actual resolving the combat. So the first thing it says is move the US units to the battle map. So, um, let me give you a quick look here at what the U.S. units are. So we have all these ships, and I'm going to move them over off camera for a second. Okay. And then I have a transport with a battalion on it. I'm moving that over. And then I have a bunch of planes. Okay. I don't have any infantry unit on the island. So just remember that. If you remember that much, uh, you got this. All right. So now I'm going to move the camera back over. So what does it mean to move the U.S. forces to the battle map? Well, the uh, airplanes are simple. They go into the U.S. airfields. So um, I like to separate them out by their type. So, for example, this is a fighter type, um, another fighter type, but he has bombing capability. This is a pure fighter, and it looks like those are, that's another bomber. So we have one, two, three, four, five... Um, Five planes, so you then have an airfield size of five. Now, uh, I griped about this in my previous video, and uh, one of my viewers even commented about he totally agrees. Um, one of the biggest gripes I have with this game is that, um, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but if you can destroy this airfield and reduce it to four strength, then one of your planes gets destroyed. So the trick to this game is not to actually fight the other planes, but just destroy their airfields so that way they die when they have to land. And um, uh, it's a little cheesy. So uh, this particular island has a maximum airfield size of eight. So a lot of people are house ruling it and they put an eight here instead of a five. So even though you only have five planes, the airfield's big enough to handle eight. 
And so you force the enemy to have to damage an empty airfield for a while before they can actually start to destroy your planes and your planes have nowhere to land. I love that rule, to be quite honest with you. Um, I think to avoid confusion, I'm going to follow the strict rules. But um, it's an excellent house rule. I highly recommend that you consider it. And um, uh, it's as simple as uh, just whatever size the island supports. So the island supports an 8, so you would put an 8 there instead of a 5. Um, but with that said, uh, we are now mostly set up. The transport gets set up in the coastal region. And um, I don't know how well you can see the screen, uh, but that's the U.S. beaches there. So our troops are going to land on the beach at that part of the island. Now, it's thematically on there for you that there's a beach that they're going to land on. Um, it really makes no difference where on the island you put your units. Um, the one thing to understand, though, is that when your forces land on the beach, they still aren't in fighting shape until they get into their foxhole. So this is like a three-step process. They arrive on transport, then the next turn they're gonna be on the beach, and then the next turn they're gonna be in the foxhole. So if you can understand that there's that sequence uh, before the infantry is finally able to participate in the battle, uh, that'll take you far. Okay, um, as far as your ships go, if you happen to have any carriers, which we do, the carrier has to be in the ocean, which is this step here. So carrier has to be in the ocean. The cruisers and everything else can be wherever you'd like. So um, the key thing here is that there is no enemy Navy presence. So I don't need to send my cruisers or anything to protect my carrier. No destroyer. That's why I bring the destroyer along to protect the carrier. There is no Japanese um, Navy presence. However, there is a Japanese air presence. And let's get them on the board. There's, I know they said set up the U.S. forces first, but the Japanese forces, this one was already on the island, so he's going to be in the Japanese foxhole. That means he's participating in the battle ASAP. Okay? And then the Japanese, their airfield, they have one, two, three, four as well, and the airplanes for them could target the island, they could target any ships like my transport here in the coastal region, or they can try to go after our carrier. All of those are fair game for uh, the enemy uh, planes, and we're not going to know which one they choose. They're going to choose it through a die roll, and um, it's a pretty good uh, system for them. So I'm going to put uh, four strength for their airfield. And again, this is the same deal. We're going to be able to s destroy their planes easy too. And uh, if you play the house rule, you would give them an eight strength as well. So we would have to do four hits to their airfield before we could damage their plane. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You just, as long as you keep that in mind, you're good. So um, my submarine is useless. There's nothing for him to attack. Um, so it doesn't matter where I put him. So I'll just put him there. Uh, everybody else, I, um, for example, I'm going to keep my destroyer back here to provide some air support for the carrier. Um, however, I may want to keep him here to do air support for the transport. Like, it's all, you know, six or one half. But I'm going to put all three of my cruisers on the shore to help protect that transport and also to pound the island with uh, attacks. So that's a setup. You get to basically choose the, the island stuff. You don't get to choose where you're going. Those are fixed. You know, the planes go in the airfield. Any infantry that was on the island goes in a foxhole. Any infantry that's not on the island is on a transport. That's it. You get three. Those are, the only, you know, those are fixed. You don't get to choose anything. The only choices you get at this stage is where are you going to put your navy. And remember that the carrier has to go in the ocean. It can't go up near the shore. The transport has to go in the coast. So even then, you still don't have choices. I did have a choice to put him here or there. And that same choice was for all three of these. And then the submarine could have actually, if there was an enemy carrier, our submarines can actually be in their ocean space. The submarine is the only one 
that can go into the enemy ocean space. I can't send like a cruiser up against their carriers up here. That doesn't work, okay? Um, so this is pretty much a useless item. I put it down here for no purpose. And uh, I think I've done more than enough to explain that. So let's uh, resolve the battle. Okay, first thing we do is we roll for battle turns. We're still in the setup. I rolled a seven. So we just look at this chart and a seven means we're gonna have three battle turns. Next, we're gonna determine the Japanese plans. And you just look at this little chart here and you count their units. So they have one, two, three, four, five units. So with five units, they're gonna get two battle plans. So you just move this number two into that box to show that they're gonna get two battle plans. Now, one other thing to point out is that we have the Enterprise there, our carrier. So let me grab, oh, where's our sheet? Here it is. So when you look at your sheet, right, and down at the bottom, it shows that our carrier air group with a cost of five, which the Enterprise is a cost five carrier, it has one Wildcat, the F4F, two dive bombers, the SBDs, and one torpedo bomber, okay? So um, that you get out now. So just give me a second. Here's the torpedo bomber. Here's the Wildcat. And I just need to find two. There's one dive bomber. Here's the other. Okay, so we got um, all four planes are with that carrier right now. And so um, they're represented in the ocean at the moment. Okay? So um, last but not least during setup is we always get three points for battle plans. And then we get to add three more for every supply point we spend. We have no supply points, so we can't buy any more. Now, uh, you're going to quickly learn I have some favorite battle plans. And um, I hate going through them all and explaining them all, but let's try to do this real quick. Um, some of them are going to be uh, very specific to situations that, that we don't have in our battle. So, for example, this one. Uh, it costs three points, which means this would be the only battle plan we can take. Um, you roll depth charge attacks before the torpedoes. So that means that like we discovered the, tor the submarines, the enemy submarines, before they had a chance to attack us. Um, there is no enemy submarine, so this is a worthless one, but it's one of the choices we have, right? So I'm just gonna set that aside. Here's another one, sonar, re-roll a depth charge or torpedo roll. Um, this means that if you have a destroyer, you get to uh, re-roll an attack against the sub, or if you have a sub, you get to, you know, roll twice, you know, re-roll a die for your attack. Well, our sub can't attack anybody, so again, not helpful. So as you see, there's some of these are going to be immediately, like, off your list. This one might be interesting. Stop a hit on one of our aircraft. Well, we do have our carrier aircraft, and we have some land-based aircraft, so this might be helpful, so I'll set that aside. This one, first light, um... We get to pre-attack for one carrier group. And um, I'd have to look in the rules for what the save means. I think I know what it means, but but um, but basically uh, we get to do, I think this, this basically means that we get to uh, take one of our uh, carrier groups, the planes, and attack uh, before they get to do their anti-aircraft. I'd have to look it up and uh, the point is, is that this is useless for us, so I'm going to just set this aside. But let's look it up right now, since I'm talking about it. I would like to, as you can tell, I don't use that one very often. So first light says, roll a die at the start of the battle turn. Let's, let me show you what it is. Roll a die at the start of the battle turn. If you roll a seven or higher, you can select the carrier-based aircraft from any one of your carriers to conduct their ground or ship attacks and return to the carrier before Jap Japan even gets to move their aircraft. Uh, the aircraft you select do not move and attack during the normal step. If you roll a six or a less, you can save this counter and roll to use it again. Keep saving it until you finally roll a seven or more. Oh, that's a pretty cool, that is actually pretty cool. 
Um, and then after you finally do it, you proceed with your normal turn. Okay, that's not bad at all. And it says that you can attack any target. So like we could use this to uh, attack the ground-based targets there. I still don't like it for this particular battle. Uh, it's best used if you're playing against an enemy carrier. Stop one hit on an airfield. This one might be good for us. If we bomb something, we get an extra hit if we succeed at our bomb. If we have infantry ashore, we don't yet, uh, we can get one automatic successful infantry attack. And it's, an, it's basically uh, the artillery gets to do the attack. And I've been playing that, that you have to wait until you get to the infantry attack step to be able to use it. Um, sometimes your infantry dies before you get there. So anyways, it's a nice one. This one we can't afford. It costs four. It says just stop any hit. This one, our surface attack, uh, if it succeeds, it does one extra hit. We happen to have three cruisers here that are doing surface attacks. Uh, that's actually a really good one. Adjust the battle duration by one. It could be increase it by one or decrease it by one. We get to choose. I'm not going to do that one, uh, but it's a really nice one. Um, Dogfight success does one extra hit. So our fighters, if we do actually hit them, we get to hit twice. This one's actually pretty good. Uh, Anti-aircraft, if it hits, it hits twice. That's not a bad one either. I don't think I'm going to do it, but that's a good one. This is roll an extra anti-aircraft for a ship. This one you can only use if you have Marines. It costs nothing, by the way. This one, reroll an infantry attack. And then this one is get an extra attack on an infantry. Um, so a lot of good ones, but they're situational. And like I said, we get three points. I happen to really like ranging shots. Um, being able to hit with a cruiser is pretty easy to do, and getting an extra hit is sweet. So that costs one point, but then what am I gonna do with the other two points? And there's two ways to go. We can grab one of these two pointers, like the diving attack is off the table now, uh, but like stopping a hit on an airfield is big. Um, getting an artillery attack is really nice. Stopping a hit on an aircraft is nice. Uh, but I'm actually going to go with two and three like that. This one I get an extra hit with dogfights, and this one I get to roll an extra anti-air with my ships. Um, and I have a feeling I'm going to definitely get to use all three. Okay? All right, so now we're ready to do the battle. So we've got our plan in place. The battle's about to commence. So here we're going to draw Japanese battle plans. It's the very first step. How many do we draw? Two. So come over here, I got my little cup, shake it up pretty good, and I'm drawing two. All right, I got them in my hand, I haven't looked at them yet. Let's move the camera over. So Japanese battle plan number one is screening ship. Stop one hit inflicted on a carrier. Um, the Japanese don't have any carriers, so you might be inclined to say, well, that's useless, and it is. Um, the key, though, is Japan draws battle plans every single combat turn. So since there's three turns, they're going to draw two plans here, two plans here, two plans here. Our three battle plan points was one time. It's for the whole combat. So just because they drew a crappy one this turn doesn't mean they're going to draw a crappy one every turn. And then in fact, this one's a really good one for them. They're, uh, they're going to have artillery, and they're going to get an automatic attack with their infantry. So that's no good. Okay? So next, move U.S. aircraft. So here we got to decide what our aircraft are going to do. Um, we can send them anywhere. Uh, right now we have uh, two targets. We have the land targets. And, uh, well, for our bombers, we have one target. That's the land. Uh, our fighters, though, have three places to go. We can go to the land to protect our bombers. We can go here to protect our ships, or we can go here to protect the the um, the Enterprise, so the CAG. So what I tend to like to do is I'm going to leave the uh, Wildcat here to defend against uh, 
anything that tries to attack our carrier, right? So we're gonna have one fighter there. And then you can see here, we actually have two sets of fighters and I'm gonna put uh, one set of fighters on land and then this one is gonna help defend these guys. And then uh, this fighter here is going to also attack the land. And all of our bombers are attacking land for sure. There's not even a choice. So all of the carrier bombers and the land bombers, everything's going up against uh, the land targets. So I split up my fighters to protect the different um, areas we have and also to protect our bombers. So we have, I believe, two or three fighters. And I didn't need to stack them up like this. I could just, I really should have just left it be because having them all straight across like this is probably the best because you need to see them all. So here you go. We have two fighters protecting the land and then one, two, three, four, five bombers uh, bombing the land. Okay, one fighter just protecting our ships and then one more on CAG duty, okay? So next thing we do is we move the Japanese bombers. So if there were bombers on a carrier, uh, the bombing groups on each carrier um, is its own group. And here's what I mean by that. So just like we had this, the Japanese have them too. So, uh, for example, an escort carrier has one dive bomber. That would be considered one bombing group. This is also a different one bombing group. These two, this is a dive bomber and a torpedo bomber. Both of them together is one bombing group because they both come from the same carrier. Does that make sense? So this would be, if I had three carriers here from Japan, that would be one, two, three bombing groups. Um, so now when we're talking about the land, the bombing groups are all one group. So for example, uh, this guy here, he has the 4-4, but he doesn't have any anti-air dog, dog fight value. That's a bomber. And uh, so is this one. And those are one bombing group. So we're gonna roll for them together on where they're gonna go. Now these two, these two are fighters because they have the dog fight values. And if they, sometimes a fighter can have a dogfight value and a bombing value, like you see here, um, that is still considered a fighter group because if they have the dogfight value, they're a fighter as far as the game is concerned. It doesn't matter if they have bombing values because uh, they can also bomb, but from purposes of the game, they're considered a fighter. So Japanese bombing groups go first. That would be these two and you just roll one die and it controls, they're both gonna stick together. Okay, so the bombers don't spread out, spread apart and split up unless they come from like different carriers, okay? So how does this work? Well, we just roll a die. I rolled a five. So then you look on the board and you can see the island says three to five. And so is that a viable target for the bomber? Well, yes it is. So they're actually gonna bomb the island, okay? So I was afraid they were gonna try to bomb here were there, and that's not what happened. So I had some fighters waiting to you know, ambush them, but they're staying on the island. So now their fighters, uh, they roll, okay? And um, do they roll together as one group? That's a good question. Why don't I know that answer? It doesn't come up super often. All the fighter on each Japanese aircraft carrier are considered to be one group. All the Japanese land-based fighter aircraft are considered to be one group. Page 17. Okay, so it's exactly the same as what I just described with the bombers. The, uh, the fighters have the same exact rule. So we're going to roll once. Now, the difference here is, is their fighters could stay to protect their bombers, or their fighters can go to engage our fighters somewhere else. So by splitting my fighters up into three places, 
I now gave them three targets. So there's some strategy there. I, I fully confess to you that wasn't my strategy. I was more just thinking defensively, but it does actually help divide up their, their planes. So we rolled a seven. And so what's happening here is we do have like, for example, a fighter protecting our carrier here in the seven because the US Ocean is seven to 10. And so their fighter group will actually come out and dogfight us here. Um, let me make sure I got that right. Because I'm feeling like I just said something wrong. Japanese fighters can only move to an area with Japanese aircraft or U.S. aircraft. So, yes, I got it correct. So you can sort of cheese the, the battle a little bit like that. Because um, you could probably argue, hey, that would have been smarter for them to protect their own bombers. And the answer is yes, it would have been smarter for them to do that. But they go anywhere we have aircraft. So by me leaving one aircraft where I did and them rolling the way they did, that's where they go. And they are considered one group, so they go together. I hope that makes sense. So um, anyways, uh, let's move on. So we moved the Japanese bombers, we moved the Japanese fighters. Now we go to combat. The first thing that happens is dogfighting. So the dogfighting is going to happen in two places. Uh, and we're gonna start with the carrier. So the way you read this is that 6-3 means I'm gonna roll 10 sided die. If I roll a six or a less, he's gonna hit one time. If I roll a three or a less, he'll hit a second time. So, um, so he could possibly do two hits. And then um, this one's an eight four, which is even better for him. All right, so I'm gonna do this. This is the six three. This is the eight four. And I'm just gonna roll two dice. So I rolled a 10 for the 8-4. Couldn't have rolled better there. But the 6-3 uh, hit twice. So we got two hits. Now, um, in a dogfight, the only thing they're hitting is another enemy plane. So let's just assume with me for a second that it was this situation. Two hits means that they're going to hit twice. And we get to choose what gets hit. However, we're stuck to specific rules and we have to look at these brackets. So see how this has a one in the bracket and this has a two? So if I'm doing two hits, I have to damage this one first because he's lower bracket number. And then he's still a lower bracket number, so then I'd have to destroy it. And this one would come out scot-free uh, with the two hits. So, um, uh, I just wanted to make sure you understood that that's, that's how you look at the brackets to determine which plane gets hit. Well, in our case, uh, this is the situation. So two hits means we're just completely destroyed. But it's a simultaneous battle, so we get to roll two. So our, yeah, let's roll for us. And we have a 5-3 roll. And I rolled an 8, so we completely screwed the pooch on that one. Okay, so we lost our Wildcat. Um, completely annihilated. Uh, there's no harm, because remember, carriers replace all their planes. Um, however, for the rest of this battle, we don't have them. And for now, their fighters at least did their job and removed one of ours. But we do have one more dogfight opportunity, because they have bombers over the island. And I'm just trying to find a place to put the camera here. And if I zoom in, they got these two bombers here. And I'm going to grab our fighters and move them up next to you, next to there. So you can see we have a 5-3 and another 5-3. So we have two fighters going up against their bombers. And um, it's the same rules. Uh, we, we get to roll and make an attack. And since there's no enemy fighters, we're not going to get shot back. So we basically, it's like a free attack without any consequences. So they're both 5-3. And I rolled a two and a two. That's four hits. That was an amazing roll. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was an amazing roll. Um, and here's what's even crazier. This says, in a dogfight, we get an extra hit. I'm not even sure I'm gonna get to use it at this point, so. So we rolled four hits, and it's the same rules. What's the smaller bracket number? That's a two. 
This is a two. So then which one? We get to choose, actually. Um, when they're the same number, we get to choose. So this one has better bombing numbers, so we could have chosen to hit this one first. Now, the Japanese have a very specific rule that we don't. If you um, get another choice like this, you must destroy a unit first before you can damage the next one. That's specific to the Japanese. In our case, if there was only two hits, we could have chosen to do something like this to save our planes, right? Because we're trying to prevent them from being destroyed, so we could have damaged both of them. Um, that's not the way it works with the Japanese rules. Um, so when you hit the Japanese, you must fully destroy one unit before you can even damage the next. We did four hits. They're both destroyed. So, so both planes are out of commission. Now what happens when they're out of commission? <clears throat> well, to come back over here, and we're talking land-based aircraft, not the carrier ones, uh, they go back into the Japanese reinforcements at the bottom of the stack. So they're ready for... You know, they can get replaced through the manufacturing. Okay, so they did their job, our fighters did, and so there's no enemy bombers there anymore. So now uh, we move on to the next step, anti-air. Okay, so anti-air is going to happen against their fighters because they are over the ocean. So even though they just successfully, you know, won their dogfight, we now have to do the anti-air against them. And anti-air is, um, it's pretty simple. I know I screwed it up in my last playthrough, but basically for every plane there is, a ship can shoot anti-air. So let's talk about that. This three on the top is the anti-air value. The two is the naval combat, the surface value. And then the three is the anti-submarine, the depth charge value, okay? So the anti-air value is this three. Now, um, with carriers, there's a special rule where you have an escort uh, range and then a carrier range. So let's say that there was only one plane. Norm uh, let's talk about this zone here. So let's say there was one plane here. Only one of these ships can attack a plane. So a plane can only be attacked once by anti-air. So in this case, I would just pick whichever one has the best anti-air value. They're all the same, but I would pick one and then that one would attack that plane and that's it. The other two don't get to do an attack. Now, if I had two planes here, then I would pick two of them to do an attack. And don't get fooled and think, oh, I gotta say this guy's attacking this one and this guy's attacking, nope, nope, nope. You're using the brackets, remember? So you're just rolling to see if you get hits. That's all you're doing. And then once you know how many hits you did, then you go in and look at the brackets and assign the hits, okay? Um, the number of planes dictates how many ships can fire. So if there's two planes, only two of the three ships can fire. If there was three planes, then all three ships. If there was four planes, then all three ships still only fire once, okay? They can't fire twice. So uh, if you have more than three planes, you're, you're not increasing the number of times they're shooting. So now let's talk about the carrier rule. The carrier rule is a little special. What it's saying is that an escort row fires and a carrier row fires for each ship. So if I have only one fighter here, and if they were here, only one of these, one of these three would have fired at him, correct? Well, in the ocean, this one gets to fire at him and the carrier gets to fire at him. Both of them do, okay? Now, I happen to have two planes and I only have two ships here. So again, they're both going to get to fire and don't get extra shots. But if I would have had another uh, ship here like this, all three of these ships would have been able to fire against both of those guys, okay? Now, if I would have had this situation, it's still only three of the four ships because that's not a carrier, right? So this would be in the escort row. So basically I have three escorts and only two ships. So only two of those three escorts get to shoot. The carrier gets to shoot no matter what. And now let's say I had another carrier. Well then four shot ships get to shoot. And then if I had yet another carrier, only two of the three carriers would get to shoot. Because you just look at the row. This row uh, is the same exact rules you saw up here. 
And then it's just that there's two rows where you get to apply the rules. I hope I did a good job of explaining it. It's sort of hard to get your mind around at first, but that's how it works. All right, so let's get back to our situation, which is this. So uh, the destroyer rules a three, and then the carrier has a four two. Just like the dogfight rules, the carrier actually has an ability to do two hits. Um, and then remember, we get to roll an extra anti-air for a ship. So um, I'm gonna choose the carrier, of course. So let's do the carrier. Uh, four two, I'm gonna get to roll two dice because I get to roll an extra anti-air for a ship. So I'm gonna roll two dice. And they both missed. I got a six and a seven. So that really blew. And then yes, this is burnt. So I gotta take that away. And then for the um, the destroyer, I get a three and that's a nine. So I missed across the board. The anti-air did not do anything for me there. Uh, these ships here don't get to do any anti-air. There's no planes uh, engaged with them. Next is bomb runs, okay? So your bomber has to survive the dogfight and the anti-air to do a bomb run, which for Japan, uh, they didn't survive. So we're gonna use the land value for these land ones. So we have a two, 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 three of them, a three, 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 three of them, and a four. Does that make sense? Doesn't matter which die is which, as long as you know that there's three twos, three threes, and a four, that's all you need. I happen to have three dice here. So let's roll for the three twos. I rolled a two, so that's one hit, okay? Just count up your hits. You don't have to worry about anything else yet. So now I get three threes. I missed on all three of them. And then I get one four, and I missed on that one. So I only got one hit for all those bombers, which that blows. Now, how does that hit get assigned? Same as always. The airfield has a one on it, and the infantry has a two. I really want to kill the infantry, but instead I damage the airfield by one. So now their airfield's down to three, which is not a problem for them because we destroyed their bombers, two of them, in fact. So they're not even uh, sweating yet. Okay, we did our bomb runs. Next is torpedoes. That would be the submarine attack. Depth charge would be the submarine defense. We don't have to do either of those. Next is naval guns. And yes, um, any ship that's on the coastal region gets to do a navy gun attack. So that would be these three. And you can see four, four, four. And it's gonna be the same exact rules. They're, they're, they're attacking either the island or enemy ships. And you don't get to decide which one. It's You look at all the brackets and if you do you're just counting hits, and then once you get a hit, you, you determine which one gets hit based on the brackets, okay? In this case, there's no enemy ships, so that makes it a little simpler, but um, basically we're, we're bombarding the land. So four, 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 three dice, and I rolled a four here, a 10, and a six. So it would normally be one hit, except um, a ship surface attack if I succeed, I get an extra hit. So that's two hits we just did. So two hits is gonna destroy their airfield even more, right? So now their airfield's down to one. I still didn't hit that dang pesky infantry and I'm not going to because um, of this reason. So uh, that part, uh, I have to hit all those airfields. So those airfields are sort of protecting that infantry from taking damage at the moment. Okay, so what's next? Next is the infantry. Well, they have one infantry unit here with a four, and they have this, which is a successful infantry attack. So they automatically got one hit on us. And then I'm gonna roll for their four, and I rolled a seven, okay? So their infantry missed. Now, what would they hit? Well, there's only one thing for them to hit. They're hitting the airfield. So this five is going to become a four, which is a problem for us. A big problem, in fact. So they just knocked us down to a four. Okay, and uh, then the infantry advance. So what does that mean? Well, it means our battalion lands on the beach and then this transport swims away. Okay, 
So we're on the beach with our battalion. Uh, now that he's on the beach, we still can't fire when it's our turn. When we do infantry attack, he can't attack yet. He has to get into his foxhole, but the enemy infantry can hit him because he's on the island, he's fair game. All right, so then after we do that, it says return aircraft and then inflict losses, okay, and then advance the counter. So first things first, all the... Um, all of the uh, carrier aircraft are gonna return to the carrier. If your carrier is damaged, or the enemy carrier, like this, the aircraft can't land, they all get destroyed, okay? So important to be able to get that early hit on a carrier um, so you can take their airplanes out of the battle, okay? Um, that's not the case here, our planes landed just fine. Their planes are trying to land, and guess what happened? They only have a size one airfield, so we have to destroy one of their planes. We get to pick, because you look at the brackets to decide, we're gonna pick the more powerful one. And uh, he just goes to the bottom of their reinforcement queue. So yes, we eliminated a Japanese airplane. And unfortunately for us though, there's a four here, and we got the same problem. One, two, three, four, and then this one's a fifth one. So uh, we have to lose one, and it's the same deal. We're gonna pick one that has a value of a one. And so I think I'm gonna pick this one because uh, he's our weakest one. So we have to destroy that plane. And the plane, when we lose them, we can rebuild those as well. Uh, if you lose a ship, there is no rebuilding a ship. Those are out of the game, but the... Um, the planes in the infantry can be replaced. Okay, um, so now that we have that uh, squared away, we landed our planes, we applied our damage. Uh, do you see now the value of damaging the airfields? If those airfields were size eight, like the house rule said, neither of us would have lost a plane at this point. Um, it does change the game a bit, but uh, it is a nice house rule. Anyways, um, we advance the turn counter. If this would have been at zero, the battle would have ended and it would have just been basically a draw because nobody won, but that's not the case here. So we go back to the top and we're gonna draw Japanese battle plans. So these two battle plans go away. I know it says save, but we're not saving the carrier one. And I'm grabbing one and I'm going to grab another. Because of the size of these, they don't shuffle really well in the cup. All right, so ship combat is plus three, plus two. This is a deadly one when they have ships. Uh, I hate drawing that one. It's a very powerful one for the Japanese. I know you might complain that, hey, they drew one about a carrier when they didn't even have one. When they have naval ships and draw this, um, it makes up for it. They are devastating when they have that. And then this one is no attacks in the Japanese ocean, which means their carriers are gonna be safe. And again, in our case, both of those were wonderful because neither of them apply. All right, so I'm gonna, now that you've seen how a battle round works, I'm gonna to try to move it up a little quicker. So everything's attacking the land. There's no reason not to. And, um, the ships aren't even in fear anymore because all it is is a fighter plane. They don't even have a bomber. So um, we do have to roll for what their fighter would do, but their fighter has nowhere to go but the island as well. So we're going to force them to do a dogfight on the island. Okay, and the dogfight is exactly what happens next. So we're going to roll for them. And their plane has a 6-3. I rolled a 6, so that's one hit for them. And then we have two of them that are 5-3. Actually, we have a third one that's 5-3, so we're gonna roll three dice. And I rolled an eight, eight, and eight. Oh my gosh. I had this thing that does one extra hit. We could have just destroyed their plane, but uh, that did not happen. They did do a hit to us, so I have to figure out who's gonna get damaged. And I'm gonna choose to damage this guy. So you flip it over, like so. It'd be nice not to lose them. Okay, so then we do anti-air. There is no anti-air on an island, by the way, in case you were wondering. So now bomb runs. 
So again, we have a two and a two, so two twos. This is a one, three, 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 and a four. So let's try to do it in the reverse order. So let's start with the four. I rolled a six. Let's do the three threes. Uh, I rolled one hit. And then we said there were two twos. There's another hit, and then there's a one. So I actually got two hits, which I'm pleased with. So what that does is that did destroy the airfield. So guess what? Their plane's gonna be destroyed. And uh, since dogfight's over, I'm gonna go ahead and just destroy it. That occurs later in the turn, but there's nothing there. And then the infantry takes a damage because we did two hits. So we're finally able to hit the infantry. So um, I'm gonna just go even quicker. And now we're on this where there's three ships that have a four. So I'm gonna roll, and if I get one more four, I win. And I got a five, a seven, and I don't know if you can see this way up here, but that's a one. So I hit and I destroyed their infantry, which also goes to their reinforcement pool. And the battle's over, we won. So, uh, so we collect, uh, well, first of all, the carrier planes just go back in the box. You don't even keep those. The ships and everything head back to the map. So I'm grabbing those. So New Guinea gets its ships back and the battalion solidly takes control. We gain control of the objective because there's no Japanese presence. And then four of our planes survive and stay on the island, with one of them being damaged. And just to give you a sneak peek, the cost to build the plane, which is one, um, to repair uh, anything in this game, you pay half the cost rounded down, but you never pay zero. So it would cost us one supply point to flip this back over. And it's during the supply point phase where we would do that. So for now, it's damaged and just sitting there on the island uh, until we can, we can fix it. Uh, the Japanese, if they're damaged, they actually have a different way of handling it. Uh, basically, what happens is they go back into the reinforcement pool and uh, to get repaired, if you will. Okay, so I'm at an hour and 27 minutes. Uh, it took us a long time to get through that, but that was with a lot of instruction. We can go through it a little bit quicker now that you've seen and experienced how these work. Um, oh my gosh, I skipped the rule, didn't I? Right here, <laughs> if the Japanese start with forces ashore, add one Japanese land-based aircraft from their reinforcement area to the Japanese airfields. Oh. So what would have happened is this guy would have also been with them, a bomber. I don't know what to say because we had, this bomber would have gone after one of our targets um, I'm not going to try to retcon this, but this bomber would have been involved in the battle because that's what the rules say. I even mentioned to you that I always forget to do these rules, and what did I do? I forgot to do the rule. <laughs> um, the Japanese did start with forces ashore, so they were supposed to have an extra plane in that battle. My apologies, already screwed up something, and this is one I knew, knew about. Uh, I feel bad, um, but I'm not going to fix it now. It's a solitaire game. Uh, we'll survive. I don't think it would have changed the outcome of the battle. It is possible that their infantry might have killed one more of our planes because they would have, you know, damaged our battalion unit or maybe damaged the airfield. Um, I'm guessing they would have damaged our battalion unit. Um, we did also have a dogfight hits one extra time. So their bomber could have been destroyed because we remember we had the dogfight does one extra hit and we did the four hits. I could have played this, and that bomber would have been involved in that initial battle and at least had one hit on it. So it would have already been uh, one hit away from being destroyed. So there's factors like that. And then when we destroyed their airfield the second time, I mean, that bomber could have gone after one of our ships and our ship's anti-aircraft would have hit it. Uh, there's a real good chance we would have just wiped out their, their bomber anyways. Um, so my apologies there. 
I screwed it up. Okay. So as I was saying, uh, we still have uh, one, two, three, four more battles to do. They should go quicker, but I guarantee you uh, this is another full hour of video to, uh, to get through all four of these. And um, this is really what's going to make or break whether or not you like Nimitz. Um, you know, I would say that there's two major things that people complain about. The first one is the randomness by which they move around. Um, I sort of like it. Uh, especially now that they added these fleets, right? That's a big deal. The other one is this. Uh, if you don't enjoy resolving these conflicts and all the tedium that goes with it, and sometimes the conflicts can be tedium. I mean, for Pete's sakes, I have one itty bitty battalion unit here and they have like an armada. <laughs> um, the It's still going to take us probably 10 to 20 minutes to resolve that. So, um... Anyways, uh, that's my point, and uh, I was going to say that I'm very pleased with my second playthrough so far because I'm incorporating all the rules that I, you know, had to make an errata video for, but uh, then I go and, and miss this right here, those special rules. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to just chuck it up to it being late, and I'm too tired. That's it. I'm, my story, I'm sticking to it. So uh, anyways, have a, um, uh, you know, thanks for watching. Stay healthy and safe. Stay awesome. All those things. And um, yeah, I am going to hit the hay here. And then maybe we'll crack at this some more tomorrow. Uh, for those of you who I know, and there has been a few of you who have been watching the videos as soon as I release them, my apologies that I'm starting over, but I hope you're going to find this to be a lot cleaner playthrough. And I hope you appreciate that. I know anybody else who's trying to learn this game will. And um, like I said, I was disappointed with the original quality. So have a good night, everybody. And we'll see you later.